Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You probably remember the story of the Magi visiting from, oh, things like children's program. Uh, but the truth is far more, the story is far more suited to adults. It's got danger, death, and a peek at the dark inner workings of the real world of politics. The, for instance, the powerful, brooding, and dangerous character Herod would fit very nicely, I think, in shows like The Game of Thrones. Herod is a cunning, effective, and cruel leader of Idomea. He was, uh, Herod the Great was loyal to Rome in particular. He was efficient and he was ruthless. He was very loyal to Rome because they gave him his power. Um, he also completed several building projects and had uh, various uh, wives. However, when the Magi show up, Herod senses a threat to his power. He was greatly troubled, we're told, and apparently, perhaps for good reason, the rest of the rulers of Jerusalem were also greatly troubled, worried about the city's fragile stability and perhaps Herod's paranoia. So there's, in the story, we also have the scribes who play a major role, and they were lawyers of God's rules and the scriptures. And it was their job to parse and apply the, the laws of the Torah and to make sense of what the scriptures said. The chief priests are other characters, and their job was to be in charge of the temple. And the they were also political intermediaries between the Jews and Rome. A coming king is yet another uh, character, the David's promised son, the Messiah, and he was widely anticipated by quite a few faithful Jews. But the picture of the Messiah in the Old Testament is a bit blurry, although one thing was very clear. The prophet Micah said the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. The scribes and the chief priests, of course, relay this information to Herod. The Magi, they know enough, apparently, to read the signs that there is a new king in Israel. But they are not so familiar, apparently, with the Hebrew scriptures, and so the Magi assume that this king will be born in the political capital, Jerusalem. Perhaps they might even approach King Herod, it's quite possible, as if they think he is the proud new papa of the newborn king proclaimed by the heavens. Congrats, Dad. Here's how I sort of imagine the conversation between the Magi and King Herod playing out. The Magi begin talking about how the stars are proclaiming a new and glorious kingdom that will be great in all the earth, and Herod likes all this. He's soaking it up, as both he and the Magi quite possibly are assuming that this has something to do with his dynasty. But then the other shoe drops, and apparently there's a break in the action. The Magi elaborate that the signs in heavens above have let them know that a new king has been born in Israel. Well, Herod continues smiling, continues smiling but he uh, there's a, they break, and apparently Herod goes to consult with his leaders, and his mind is already plotting away. Now, even telling Herod that his own son would be the glorious new ruler would have been bad enough. History reveals that Herod killed two of his own sons because he felt threatened by them. But an outsider, not even of his own blood, threatening his power? Well, Herod is apparently a convincing actor because although his wicked mind is churning beneath the surface, he asks for time to confer with his, with his wise men, the chief priests and the scribes. Afterwards, Herod puts on a big smile when he meets with the Magi again and says, you know what, the new king was born, but not just not here, in Bethlehem. You know, I'm excited about this. I can't wait to meet the new king. 
you know what, I just had a great idea. You guys go figure out exactly where he is and I'll let you pay your respects first, but just make sure that you come back and let me know exactly where he lives because I'm sure the new prince is dying to meet me. What is intriguing to me, I mean, the story is probably pretty familiar to you, but what's intriguing to me is the, the lack of action on the part of the scribes and the chief priests. I mean, Herod is greatly troubled, troubled, and that will mean trouble for those around him. And so you can understand uh, the pull for the chief priests uh, and the scribes of Jerusalem who don't want to draw the ire of Herod. They don't want him to point his uh, sword at them. So when he asks for help to find this newborn prophesied king, they help locate, they help him find the right city, Bethlehem. But apparently, nobody goes looking for this newborn king. See, the, the chief priests and the scribes know already, clearly, Herod just told them, a sign has appeared in the heavens. And plus, the chief priests at least know about the odd circumstances and the angelic claim of their contemporary, Zechariah, regarding his new son, John. The question is, why did no one else apparently go to visit this prophesied king? A simple investigation would have revealed the astounding claims of the shepherds, who told many, were told, about what they had seen and heard. However, the scribes, whose main job it was to, to search the scriptures, declined to search for the promised king. The chief priests, whose most important job was to stay loyal to the true God, sold out to a politically powerful but blatantly illegitimate king of God's people, King Herod. Again, it would, it would have been dangerous to disagree with Herod because he was so powerful and he was prone to violence. So the leaders of God's people make the expedient decision. Unfortunately, it meant in doing so, they abandoned God's plan and betrayed their king. The leaders of God's people, you see, weren't willing to commit to God's word or let his signs and Christ dictate their actions. But thank God for these magi, these foreign magi who did go where God's word led them. It just goes to show that despite dastardly plots and unbelief, God's plan of salvation was still carried out. The star shone forth, proclaiming the Savior's birth. It's this, this, this star, it's reminiscent of a variety of events in the Old Testament. It has echoes, for instance, of God's promise to Abraham to send him a seed, singular, followed up by a promise in the same verses that Abraham would have as, as many descendants as there were stars in the heavens. When Yahweh led the Israelites through the wilderness, he led them by a fiery pillar in the heavens. Isaiah uh, is perhaps the most enlightening book with connections. Alongside, right along in those same verses about the promised Emmanuel, God with us, Isaiah prophesies, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Isaiah later proclaims multiple times that God would send a light to the nations, his servant. Yahweh is always ready to add another wrinkle and in the wilderness, uh, we see more connections. He, we remember how, and he's not new, the, he led Israel through the, through the hostile territory of the Gentiles to bring Israel to the promised land. And once more, God is leading his people, this time by the light of the Christmas star. But no longer is he protecting his nation from the other heathen nations. Now, he is leading the heathen nations to his people. His own people, at least Herod and the scribes and the chief priests, are aware of these signs, but they have either ignored them or attacked this light to the nations. But these Gentile magi are not only paying tribute to the king of kings, they are also going to protect him from the leaders of God's people. This is a reminder today 
that God's kingdom comes among us. The gospel continues to be preached, but you probably will be surprised by who rejects God's message and who receives it with faith. Herod was the king of the Jews, but he tried to kill Jesus. The scribes diligently searched the scriptures, but they sought to use the scriptures against Jesus. The chief priests would not accept their chief priest. Instead, they would maliciously sacrifice him upon the cross for their own ill gain. But God's plan was greater. Jesus overcame the power-hungry, uh, desire-driven, sin-infested world. The gospel defeated violence through Jesus' willing, innocent suffering and death. The Magi are our surprising example of the proper response. You know, you think about the Magi, and you know, we know the story, but I think we often don't think about it from this angle. They really kind of got a lot wrong. <laughs> they came from, just, this wasn't really their fault, but they came from the wrong country. And they went to the wrong city. And they talked to the wrong guy, King Herod. But they kept following the instructions of the scriptures when they were told to them. And eventually, they came with humility and awe to Jesus. You know, we might not always be where we should be or know what we should know. Sometimes we don't even do what we should do. But so long as we end up seeking our Savior, following where he leads, and bow before the Savior of the nations, we will find salvation and forgiveness through Christ. Jesus remains the light, the heavenly light to the nations. Uh, God's goal is bigger than any goal that we would probably set. God's goal is not simply one nation under God. It's rather all nations under our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God continues to call all who will follow Jesus as Lord. And our consolation today is sometimes it feel, may feel lonely as Christians, but even if the, the rich and the famous or the influential can't be bothered to come to worship the Savior, you are blessed to find and bow before the Savior of the nations once more today. And that is why we are not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. In Jesus' name, amen.